I'm trying not to say we're back every time. So, but it's really hard because that's what I want to say. Um, I would like us to go over um, our vocabulary first. I kind of want to start there um, at this point. Um, we have authority, which means power. And in the reading from day one, um, it talked about how the warden had authority over all of the boys. That she was the power within the camp. We have occasionally, which means now and then. Um, so we talked about occasionally something that you might get to do um, every now and then. It's not something you get to go get to do all the time. Um, occasionally, I let my son Eli invite a friend, and they go to um, Air Raid. I think that's what it's called in London, a little jumpy place. It's not something that we do a lot because it is expensive, but every now and then, as a special treat, I take him and a friend there. We have strengthened, which means to grow stronger. It's that ED. So, um, I was, um, she strengthened her arms by working out, and over time, she became stronger. So, grew stronger. Penetrating is piercing. Um, there, you know, I talk about how I um, stepped on a nail and it was, and it penetrated my foot. We can think about a gaze as penetrating too, or someone's just giving you the evil eye. So penetrating and you feel like they can just see into your soul, into the insides of you. They've got that piercing look going on. Deposited is placed. Um, I deposited my check into the bank. So I placed it into the bank. Recited is said aloud. Hesitated is paused. If you've ever been in um, part of an academic team and you're on the buzzards, if you buzz in and then you think a minute, they will call hesitation. Or if you hesitated, they won't allow you to answer the question because you paused and didn't answer instantly. Applied is to put on. So I applied my lipstick before I went into church. On Sundays, so that means I put it on because I wanted to look my best. Um, and so those are the words that we're working with this week. Our big new skill, I mean, it's a new skill for fifth grade. I'm kind of worried about it. I ain't gonna lie. I saw some of those questions coming through to me. Um, and so you, you really need to be mindful of what you're doing. Our end in mind is you will be able to identify descriptive words and phrases um, the author provides to create the mood of hopelessness and desperation in our story. So as you uploaded questions three and four, and th number three was our big end in mind question, um, then I was, or I will be giving you feedback one-on-one -on, -one on those. Can't do that anymore via this type of scenario because kids were just kind of skipping ahead and watching it and just jotting down the correct answer and giving it back to me. So you weren't really thinking about it. And the problem with that is one, it's cheating. Two is that then when you get on the test, you don't have a clue what you're doing. And this is a skill that you will need next year in sixth grade. And I'm sure you'll need it in seventh grade and possibly eighth grade as well. So we want to make sure that you're kind of getting a good introduction into it. So let's look at question number one, because one and two, I got to flip over here, are what you put into your journal. So we can easily go over those. Number one says, why is the warden upset when Mr. Podansky, with Mr. Podansky, why is she mad at him? So the reason that Mr. Uh, the warden is upset with Mr. Podansky is because she wants him to make sure that those canteens are absolutely full of water. And I don't think she likes him questioning her authority either. I mean, that's nowhere in my answer key or whatever I've got here. But she just really comes across as like, you're questioning me. Just shut up and do what I'm telling you to do. And so, 
I think that should be part of the answer as well. Granted, the biggest part is that she wants to make sure that the boys have full canteens so that they can work at their optimal. And my evidence would be that on page 67, it says, now these fine boys have been working hard. Don't you think it might be possible that they might have taken a drink since you last filled their canteens? So we can say the warden is upset with Mr. Podansky because she wants the boys to have full canteens of water. I know this because my evidence on page 67 says, now these fine boys have been working hard. Don't you think it might be possible that they might have taken a drink since you last filled their canteens? If all you did was say my evidence is on page 67, paragraph one, it's not right. And I've got some of you all that are regressing and going back to some of those bad habits at the beginning of the year. In fourth grade, that was plenty for Miss Davis. She was satisfied with that isolation of page number and paragraph. It don't work in fifth and sixth grade. Now you've got to give more because we're building on a skill and if the skill doesn't stop, Every year, the expectation is now you got to give more, okay? Got to give it. Number two, how does the discovery of the gold tube change the digging process for the boys? And what conclusion does Stanley come to about why they are digging the holes? Now, so I could say... <clears throat> The way the discovery of the tube changes the digging process is, is now they're digging in pairs. And my evidence is on page 69, where it says, um, armpit and squid, you will keep digging where you have been, but you're each gonna have a helper. Zigzag, you help armpit, magnet will help squid, and caveman, you'll work with zero. That supports that they're working in pairs. The second part says, what conclusion does Stanley come up to about why they are digging the hole? Well, the conclusion that Stanley comes up with is that they're not digging to build a character, that they are looking for something. And he knows that because of the way she's making them reshuffle through the dirt more than once, okay? So that's where we are with those. Now, this takes us to page 74. <clears throat> now, as I'm reading, I still want you to keep that mood of hopelessness and just desperation in your mind, okay? Because when I stop, we wanna be able to pick out some phrases that support that. All right, here we go. Later, as Stanley sat sprawled across an understuffed chair, he tried to think of a way to tell the warden where the tube was really found without getting himself or X-ray into trouble. It didn't seem possible. He even thought about sneaking out at night and digging in that hole by himself. But the last thing he wanted to do after digging all day was to dig at night. Besides, the shovels were locked up at night, presumably so they couldn't be used as a weapon. Mr. Podansky entered the rec room. Stanley, he called as he made his way to him. His name's Cave Man, said X-Ray. Stanley, said Mr. Podansky. My name's Cave Man, said Stanley. Well, I have a letter here for somewhere, someone named Stanley Yelnitz, said Mr. Podansky. He turned over an envelope in his hands. It doesn't say caveman anywhere. Uh, thanks, Stanley said, taking it. It was from his mother. Who's it from? Squid asked. Your mother? Stanley put it in the big pocket of his pants. Aren't you going to read it to us? Asked Armpit. Give him some space, said X-Ray. If caveman doesn't want to read it to us, he doesn't have to. It's probably from his girlfriend. And Stanley just grinned. Well, he read it later, after the other boys had gone to dinner. Dear Stanley, it was wonderful to hear from you. 
Your letter made me feel like one of the other moms who can afford to send their kids to summer camp. I know it's not the same, but I am very proud of you for trying to make the best of a bad situation. Who knows? Maybe something good will come of this. Your father thinks he is real close to a breakthrough on his sneaker project. I hope so. The landlord is threatening to evict us because of the odor. I feel sorry for the little old lady who lived in the shoe. It must have smelled awful. Love from both of us. What's so funny? Zero asked. Well, it startled him. He thought Zero had gone to dinner with the others. Nothing, just something my mom wrote. What'd she say? Zero asked. Nothing. Oh, sorry, said Zero. Well, see, my dad is trying to invent a way to recycle old sneakers, so the apartment kind of smells bad because he's always cooking these old sneakers. So anyway, in the letter, my mom said she felt sorry for that little old lady who lived in a shoe, you know, because it must have smelled bad in there. Zero stared blankly at him. You know, the nursery rhyme? Zero said nothing. You've heard the nursery rhyme about the little old lady who lived in a shoe? No. Stanley was amazed. How does it go? Asked Zero. Didn't you ever watch Sesame Street? Stanley asked. Zero stared blankly. And Stanley headed on to dinner. He would have felt pretty silly reciting nursery rhymes at Camp Green Lake. Chapter 17 Well, for the next week and a half, the boys continued to dig in and around the area where X-Ray had supposedly found the gold tube. They widened X-Ray's hole as well as the holes Armpit and Squid had been digging until the fourth day when all three holes met and formed one big hole. As the days wore on, the warden became less and less patient. She arrived later in the morning and left earlier in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the boys continued to dig later and later. There is no, there, this is no bigger than it was when I left you yesterday, she said after arriving late one morning. Well, after sunrise, what have you been doing down there? Well, nothing, said Squid. It was the wrong thing to say. At just that moment, Armpit was returning from a bathroom break. How nice of you to join us, she said. And what have you been doing? I had to, you know, go. Well, the warden jabbed at Armpit with her pitchfork, knocking him backwards into the big hole. Well, the pitchfork left three holes in the front of his shirt and three tiny spots of blood. You're giving these boys too much water, the warden told Mr. Podensky. Well, they continued to dig until late afternoon, long after all the other groups had finished for the day. Stanley was down in the big hole along with the other six boys. They had hopped, stopped using the wheelbarrows. He dug his shovel into the side of the hole and he scooped up some dirt and was raising it up to the surface when Zigzag's shovel caught him in the side of his head and he collapsed. He wasn't sure if he passed out or not and he looked up to see Zigzag's wild head staring down at him. I ain't digging that dirt up, Zigzag said. That's your dirt. Hey, Mom, Magnet called. Caveman's hurt. Stanley brought his fingers up the side of his neck. He felt his wet blood and a pretty big gash just below his ear. Magnet helped Stanley to his feet, then up and out of the hole. Mr. Sir made a bandage out of a piece of his sack of sunflower seeds and taped it over Stanley's wound. Then he told him to get back to work. It isn't nap time. When Stanley returned to the hole, Zigzag was waiting for him. That's your dirt. Zigzag said. You have to dig it up. It's covering up my dirt. Stanley felt a little dizzy and he could see a small pile of dirt. It took him a moment to realize that it was the dirt which had been on his shovel when he was hit. Well, he scooped it up. Then Zigzag dug his shovel into the ground underneath where Stanley's dirt had been. So, 
if we think about it, you know, what I just read is all about the beginning of it is how the warden is still watching the boys. And she's watching them dig those holes. And she's not real happy with the progress that they're making. And so when I think about setting the mood of hopelessness and desperation, this kind of jumps out to me. They continue to dig until late afternoon, long after all the other groups had finished for the day. Now, to me, that really solidifies that desperation. You know, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, we're still out here. Everybody else is gone. I'm hot. I'm tired. I'm thirsty. Why are we still here? Can we not please quit and go in? That's that desperation piece, you know. We're still out here doing this horrible job and everybody else is getting to leave. We've done our whole for the day. But why are we having to do more than what everybody else is having to do? Below that, too, is probably the mom and me, because this is so sad, is where Zigzag Shovel caught Stanley in the side of the head. And he makes this big gash. And then down below it says, Mr. Sir made a bandage out of a piece of his sack of sunflower seeds and taped it over Stanley's wound. Then he told him to get back to work. It isn't nap time. So it's like he didn't even <laughs> let him go see a nurse. He didn't like say, well, come here to the truck. We need to clean it off. We need to put a real bandage. It's just kind of like tearing off a piece of brown paper bag and taping it on the side of your neck. To me, that is such hopelessness that Stanley had to be feeling at that point. It's like, ooh, I was knocked out for a minute. I come to and I'm bleeding and, you know, you're just taping something on the side of my head. That mood of telling us that this is horrible what's going on with these boys. That's what we're looking for with these end in mind questions, guys. So it's not always easy. And that's the idea. It's trying to make you think. Okay. Now, I'd like you to break your questions down. And I'm going to read them with you. That way it kind of helps me. Um, so I can kind of jot down where I'm finding my evidence as well as, as we are reading Number one says, this is our end in mind question. You might as well circle it. I don't like how these questions are begin, have begin with what language did the author use to support the mood of hopelessness and desperation in today's reading? Um, to me, it's like, what do you mean what language? So I think it really should say, how does the author how is the author supporting the mood of hopelessness and desperation in today's reading? So what words or phrases are they using? Okay. Number two, how does digging holes change Stanley physically and emotionally? How is it changing him up? Number three, why do you think Stanley lies to his parents in his letters? And then support your answer. So we're wanting evidence, guys. And four, summarize how Stanley gets in trouble over the sunflower seeds. How is he getting into trouble? All right, so let's go to page 80, which is chapter 18. Let me get a drink of water. It's good and loud, isn't it? All right. Well, the next morning, 
Mr. Sher marched the boys to another section of the lake, and each boy dug his own hole, five feet deep, five feet wide. Stanley was glad to be away from the big hole. At least now, he knew just how much he had to dig for the day, and it was a relief not to have other shovels swinging past his face or the warden hanging around. He dug the shovel into the dirt and then slowly turned to dump it into a pile. He had to make his turn smooth and slow. If he jerked too quickly, he felt a throbbing pain just above his neck where Zigzag's shovel had hit him. That part of his head between his neck and ear was considerably swollen. There were no mirrors in camp, but he imagined he looked like he had a hard-boiled egg sticking out of him. The remainder of his body hardly hurt at all. His muscles had strengthened as his hands were tough and calloused. And he was still the slowest digger, but not all that much slower than Magnet. Less than 30 minutes after Magnet returned to camp, Stanley spat into his hole. Well, after his shower, he put his dirty clothes in his crate and got out his box of stationery. He stayed in the tent to write the letter so Squid and the other boys wouldn't make fun of him for writing to his mom. Dear Mom and Dad, Camp is hard, but challenging. We've been running obstacle courses and I have to swim long distances on the lake. Tomorrow we learn. And he stopped writing as Zero walked into the tent, then returned to his letter. He didn't care what Zero thought. Zero was a nobody. To rock climb. I know that sounds scary, but don't worry. And Zero was standing beside him now, watching him write. And Stanley turned and felt his neck throb. I don't like it when you read over my shoulder, okay? Zero said nothing. I'll be careful. It's not all fun and games here, but I think I'm getting, getting a lot out of it. It builds character. The other guys... I don't know how, said Zero. What? Can you teach me? Well, Stanley didn't know what he was talking about. Teach you what? To rock climb? Zero stared at him with penetrating eyes. What? said Stanley. He was hot, tired, and sore. I want to learn to read and write, said Zero. Well, Stanley let out a short laugh. He wasn't laughing at Zero. He was just surprised. All this time, he thought Zero was reading over his shoulder. Sorry, he said. I don't know how to teach. After digging all day, he didn't have the strength to try to teach Zero to read and write. He needed to save his energy for the people who counted. You don't have to teach me to write, said Zero. Just to read. I don't have anybody to write to. Sorry, Stanley said again. His muscles and hands weren't the only part of his body that had toughened over the past several weeks. His heart had hardened as well. He finished his letter. He barely had enough moisture in his mouth to seal and stamp the envelope. It seemed that no matter how much water he drank, he was always thirsty. Now, I want you to see where you might find some evidence um, before we move on into chapter 19. Now, what I want you to do also on day two team talk, I want you to write pages 80 through 87 on it somewhere. That's where your evidence is coming from today. Okay, so look for evidence, kind of make yourself a notation on your team talk, and then we'll get right back into reading. Just a few more minutes, guys. All 
All right, let's move on to chapter 19, page 83. He was awakened one night by a strange noise. At first, he thought it might have been some kind of animal, and it frightened him. But as the sleep cleared his head, he realized that the noise was coming from the cot next to him. Squid was crying. You okay? Stanley whispered. Squid's head jerked around and he sniffed and caught his breath. Yeah, I just, I, I'm fine, he whispered and sniffed again. In the morning, Stanley asked Squid if he was feeling better. What are you, my mother? Asked Squid. And Stanley raised and lowered one shoulder. I got allergies, okay? Squid said. Okay, said Stanley. You open your mouth again and I'll break your jaw. Well, Stanley kept his mouth shut most of the time. He didn't talk too much to any of the boys, afraid that he might say the wrong thing. They called him caveman and all that, but he couldn't forget that they were dangerous too. They were all here for a reason, as Mr. Sir would say. This wasn't a Girl Scout camp. Stanley, Stanley was thankful that there were no racial problems. X-ray, armpit, and zero were black. He, Squid, and Zigzag were white, and Magnet was Hispanic. On the lake, they were all the same reddish-brown color, the color of dirt. Well, he looked up from his hole to see the water truck and its trailing dust cloud. His canteen was still almost a quarter full, and he quickly drank it down and took his place in line behind Magnet and in front of Zero. The air was thick with heat, dust, and exhaust fumes. The Mr. Sir filled their canteens, and the truck pulled away. Stanley was back in his hole, shovel in his hand, when he heard Magnet call out, Anybody want some sunflower seeds? Magnet was standing at ground level, holding a sack of seeds. Well, he popped a handful into his mouth and chewed and swallowed shells and all. Over here, called X-Ray. The sack looked to be about half full. Magnet rolled up the top, tossed them into x-ray. How did you get them without Mr. Sir seeing you? Asked Armpit. I can't help it, Magnet said. He held both hands up, wiggling his fingers and laughed. My fingers are like little magnets. Well, the sack went from x-ray to armpit to squid. It's sure good to eat something that doesn't come from a can, said Armpit. The squid tossed the bag sack to zigzag, and Stanley knew it would come to him next. He didn't even want it. And from the moment Magnet shouted, Anybody want some sun sunflower seeds? He knew there would be trouble. Mr. Sir was sure to come back. And anyway, salted shells would only make him thirsty. Coming your way, caveman, said zigzag. Airmail and special delivery. Well, it's unclear whether the seeds spilled before they got to Stanley or after he dropped the bag. It seemed to him that Zigzag hadn't rolled up the top before throwing it, and that was the reason he didn't catch it. But it all happened very fast. One moment the sack was flying through the air, and the next thing Stanley knew, the sack was in his hole and the seeds were spilled across the dirt. Oh, man, said Magnet. Sorry, Stanley said as he tried to sweep the seeds back into the sack. I don't want to eat dirt, said X-Ray. Stanley didn't know what to do. The truck's coming, shouted Zigzag. Well, Stanley looked up at the approaching dust cloud and then back down at the spilled seeds. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. What else is new? Well, he dug his shovel into the ground or into the hole and turned, tried to turn over the dirt and bury the seeds. What he should have done, he realized later, was knock one of his dirt piles back into his hole, but the idea of putting dirt into his hole was unthinkable. Hello, Mr. Sir, said X-Ray. You back so soon? It seems like you were just here, said Armpit. Time flies when you're having fun, said Magnus. Stanley continued to turn the dirt over in his hole. You girl scouts having a good time? Asked Mr. Sir. And he moved from one hole to another. And he kicked a dirt pile by Magnet's hole. And then he moved toward Stanley. Stanley could see two seeds at the bottom of his hole. As he tried to cover them up, 
he unearthed a corner of the sack. Well, what do you know, caveman? Asked Mr. Sir, standing over him. Well, it looks like you found something. Stanley didn't know what to do. Dig it out, Mr. Sir said. We'll take it to the warden. Maybe she'll give you the rest of the day off. It's not anything, Stanley muttered. Let me be the judge of that, said Mr. Sir. Well, Stanley reached down and pulled up the empty burlap sack, and he tried to hand it to Mr. Sir, but he wouldn't take it. So tell me, caveman, said Mr. Sir, how did my sack of sunflower seeds get in your hole? I stole it from your truck. You did? Yes, Mr. Sir. Well, what happened to all the sunflower seeds? Well, I am. By yourself? Yes, Mr. Sir. Hey, caveman, shouted Armpit. How come you didn't share any with us? That's cold, man, said X-Ray. I thought you were our friend, said Magnet. Well, Mr. Sir looked around from one boy to another and then back to Stanley. We'll see what the warden has to say about this. Let's go. Well, Stanley climbed up out of his hole and followed Mr. Sir to the truck. He still held the empty sack. It felt good to sit inside the truck out of the direct rays of the sun. Stanley was surprised he could feel good about anything at the moment, but he did. It felt good to sit down on a comfortable seat for a change. And as the truck bounced along the dirt, he was able to appreciate the air blowing through the open window onto his hot and sweaty face. Now, you are going to answer questions one through four in your journal. But I want us to go back to question one, okay? So, and I'm gonna give you once again some um, page numbers that I want you to look at for question one. So you're looking for support for the mood of hopelessness and desperation in today's reading. Okay, so let's see. And I want you to focus on page eight, the 80, bottom of 85 through 87. 85 through 87 for question one, okay? And that's where you're going to find your evidence to support your end in mind talking about mood. Now, you're going to answer all four of them, but I'm kind of helping you focus your mind on where you need to look for that number one. All right? Okay. See you back here tomorrow, and I'll tell you which two to upload. Bye, guys.